Welcome back to uh, ML Lunch. Uh, today we, we have with us uh, Liu Yang. Uh, Liu has done tons of interesting work on active learning over the last half decade or so, and has plenty of top uh, papers in all the uh, top conferences. Um, this is something that she's been working on recently and starting a line of work in this area, and I'll let her explain more. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. The topic I'm talking about today is machine learning over time. Uh, when the concept to be learned in the typical machine learning problem, we have a concept, the target concept to be learned. Here, actually, it changes over time. So the interesting technical challenge that comes up in this setting is that we need to treat older data uh, as less relevant than the more recent one. That is a very important um, um, point that I want to make here, which is uh, it's essential to understand that uh, the technical challenge is that we need to treat recent data as more relevant than the older data. Okay, as one example, uh, if we're trying to classify images for whether they contain our current professional basketball player, there will be some images, such as this one, uh, for which uh, the correct classification might vary over time. So basically, uh, Michael Jordan experience, some kind of a career switches in the past years. So if we're, we are asked to classify this image in 1992, say, the correct answer would be yes, right? So, but if we were asked to classify it in 2004, uh, the correct answer would be no. More broadly, uh, as we're all familiar with this kind of recommending system and how that works, so take the recommending system that tries to help users find, to find, uh, finding the pieces of information or objects that presumably the, interest, the users would be interested in. Um, as one example, say uh, the set of, of information or objects actually, uh, can be divided, divided into two categories. So it's a binary classification problem. Uh, one is interesting, another is not interesting. So uh, machine learning can be used to, uh, for recommending systems to acquire uh, interest, user interest profiles, but in reality, we know frequently users' interest drifts over time. It happens all the time. Our interest about movies shifts over time. For example, uh, we can change, the users can change their preferred genre of movie, or they can adopt a new view about certain director or certain new celebrities. So the ability to adapt fast to this kind of, uh, the, the current users' Interest is an important feature for recommending systems. Okay, so in the formal setting we study, uh, there is an instance space X, X for the unlabeled feature vectors. Uh, there is the concept space, the concept space C, and we denote uh, the uh, uh, D by uh, as the VC dimension of the concept space. C, and there's a distribution P over X, uh, and there's a sequence of ID data points sampled from this, this distribution P. Uh, there's also a sequence of target classifiers in the concept space C, which may be chosen by an adversary. So in other words, this ID sequence of, uh, so, so this sequence of target functions could come, could arrive in an adversarial way. Okay, we will denote by yt uh, the, as the t's, uh, t's target function um, for the classification problem at t's time point, okay, uh, to describe the amount by which the target drifts from time, from one time to the next, we let epsilon t denote the probability the t's target disagrees with the t minus one's target, the previous uh, time point target on a random point drawn from the underlying distribution. 
So the protocol in this setting is um, that the learning algorithm observes each example of xt in sequence, okay? Uh, and, and it's in the sequential kind of setting, and it must make a prediction for the value of yt based, on, based only on the past data and this current value of xt. So it can then observe the true value of yt so it knows whether it makes mistakes, make mistakes, uh, make mistakes or not. So we are interested in making a small number of mistakes, of course, as a function of the number of data points observed so far, which uh, we really just denote. Uh, so the, the, the data points observed so far we denote by capital T, <coughs> capital T here. Okay. Um, uh, there is some work. Um, in the special case of this kind of setting, uh, specifically if, uh, if we suppose that all epsilon t values are bounded by a known constant epsilon. So, see all these epsilon t, uh, the amounts you're allowed to vary at each time point t, are bounded by some constant epsilon, some, some known constant epsilon. Then a paper by um, Humboldt and Lau in, 19, in 1994 shows that it is possible to achieve order um, the square root d epsilon times t, okay? Again, the capital T is the number of uh, data points observed so far. Uh, among the first t examples, you can achieve such kind of a mistake uh, bound guarantees. Okay, the algorithm uses some kind of uh, empirical risk minimization techniques, so it's, uh, it is typically not computationally efficient. So that was one earlier work. And, and a more recent article uh, by Kramer, Mansour, Ivandar, and Wang in um, 2010 shows that in the special case of homogeneous linear separator, okay, uh, under a uniform distribution on sphere, okay, uh, especially it is origin-centered uh, sphere, uh, there is an efficient algorithm that makes order D epsilon to the one fourth times capital T number of mistakes, okay? Um, it, it apparently is worse than uh, the work by Humboldt and Lung. However, this algorithm by uh, Kramer uh, Mansour at all is efficient, okay? So, you know, in fact, it is this, uh, the algorithm they propose here is just a variant of perceptron algorithm. So let me remind, remind you what is perceptron uh, algorithm. It just like, it is the passive learning algorithm, which means uh, the algorithm will, will, will receive labels uh, on every single round, and then it will update um, the hypothesis if the algorithm makes a mistake on the prediction. Okay, um, so, 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 the, so the algorithm is, is just, uh, it's just a uh, perception-based kind of algorithm. They also generalize this to a family of uh, distribution called lambda good. So lambda good distribution uh, preserves some of the nice properties of uh, the uniform distribution. Uh, that basically this kind of nice property, uh, this kind of lambda good distribution relates uh, the angles, the angles for the linear separator relates the angles to probabilities of a disagreement. Okay. In this talk, we will generalize the work of uh, Humboldt and Lang to get a bound on the number of mistakes that allows an arbitrary sequence of um, epsilon t values. So our, our result is more, is more general in the sense that uh, we allow an arbitrary sequence of epsilon t sequence as epsilon t values. We will also show that this bound cannot generally be improved. Uh, so that was uh, that. That is the minimax argument, basically, uh, to show that it is sometimes it's almost tight. Uh, we will also present a technique for the special case of linear separator on a uniform distribution, studied by Kramer, at all, uh, and we'll show that it achieves a smaller bound than what they achieved on the number of mistakes for the active learning. Uh, so, so uh, for the, uh, it, the algorithm is active learning algorithm. So, which have a smaller number of mistakes uh, than what they proved for their perceptron based kind of algorithm. 
So in both cases, uh, we also present results for active learning, uh, where we do not necessarily, the distinction is that for active learning, we do not necessarily observe the true target. Um, so we, don't, we do, do not necessarily query the true target's label after each prediction, but only those we explic explicitly in the algorithm based on what kind of um, active learning strategy we use that we want querying that round, uh, we're that interested in expressing a bound on the number of uh, queries, of course, because you can see active learning achieves savings in terms of queries, uh, in addition to the bounds on the number of mistakes. Okay, so first, we will discuss the, uh, the general case. Uh, okay, so specifically, let's consider this, this algorithm. Uh, but in fact, to, to simplify the uh, discussion, let's just, uh, just ignore all the log factors that in the algorithm, everywhere in the algorithm. Okay, so the algorithm simplifies to this. Uh, basically, basically, we look at the previous m hat t data point. So it's just a little bit complicated in terms of notation here. So let's look at the previous m, m hat t data points where m hat t is the number of data points for which the empirical risk minimizer makes order d mistakes. Again, uh, order d, d is the VC dimension for the concept space c. The constant uh, k, the capital K here, is just uh, some number we picked to make the proof work out. Uh, then we use the empirical risk <coughs> minimizer on those m hat t data points to make the prediction for the next point. So this is a simple algorithm. Uh, the way then can prove this theorem. It says this, this kind of algorithm makes an expected number of mistakes among the first t instances, which is this kind of a bound. Um, right, so in this bound it basically minimizes in between uh, it's minimizing a trade-off between the two terms, as you observe. So the first term is a sum of epsilon values, right? So it, it represents the average distance between today's target, right, the today's target function, uh, and the past M target concepts. Okay, and then the second term here is just uh, represents the usual generalization error bound we have in statistical learning theory, abounding the difference between the empirical, empirical error rate of the uh, empirical risk minimizer uh, and its true error rate. Okay, so their theorem is, is quite clear. It's minimizing the trade-off between these two terms. Okay, so to prove this theorem, uh, let's first define um, T uh, star, okay, as the smallest number M such that today's target makes uh, k times d mistake, mistakes on the past m data points. So, so what is mt star at all? Well, it, it, it is like a mt hat, as we've seen before, except for today's target instead of the empirical risk minimizer. Okay, so then since the empirical risk minimizer on those mt star uh, data points makes at most as many um, mistakes as today's, tar uh, today's target uh, would do, so we know that the uh, m hat t, okay, so m hat t is no smaller than m t star. That's clear, right? But then, because the uh, number of mistakes that each hat capital T makes on the uh, m hat t points, okay, is at most k times d, Okay, we know it's also make, it will also make at most uh, uh, k times d mistakes on the past mt star data points. That's a simple argument. So uh, in particular, this means, what this means is uh, each hat t disagrees with today's target, um, today, today's target function on at most uh, two times k times d points. Okay, so applying, then we're applying kind of ratio style kind of uh, 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 inequality from statistical learning theory, we know that uh, uh, H, H hat t 
And today's targets have a probability of a disagreement, which is written here, a probability h hat t and f t star uh, disagree, the, the probability they disagree is that most order d over m t star. Okay, so far clear. Next, so if m, here, if m that minimizes the sum of these two terms, again, uh, it's a smaller than m t star, than d over m t star lower bounds the second term, okay? And if m is greater than m t star, then evaluating the average of those sums of uh, epsilons over this m t star values of s lower bounds the first term. So either way, we can just lower bound this expression by the mean of the two, uh, two terms evaluated, evaluated at m t star instead of the, the minimizing m value. Um, good. Also, also, since the first term uh, here uh, represents the uh, average distance from today's target to uh, each of the past m targets, right? So, so Burns inequality, uh, which is a typical kind of uh, concentration inequality that people can use the, in statistics, uh, implies these terms at least um, as large as the uh, fraction of those points today's target makes mistake, mistakes on. Huh? Okay, uh, minus a concentration term. Uh, and because the MT star uh, is defined in a way so that today's target makes K times D mistakes on the past um, MT star points. So this lower bound is order uh, d over um, uh, m, uh, mt star, okay? So we have a lower bound here on the minimum of the sum of the two terms that has this kind of same form as the upper bound on the error rate of h hat t. Uh, so the error rate is bounded by the minimum of the sum of the two terms. So then we just sum over the values of, um, of the capital T Again, is that kind of a sequence we observed so far to get the theorem. Okay. So that was the theorem for the general result. And uh, one simple implication of this re kind of result is that it's a necessary and a sufficient condition on the epsilon t sequence for there to exist an algorithm achieving sublinear number of uh, mistakes. Uh, for every sequence of uh, this kind of a target satisfying the sequence of epsilon t values uh, for the space of linear separator, uh, say, in two dimension. Okay, so uh, specifically, it is possible if and only if the sum of this epsilon t values grows sublinearly. Okay, so this is a sublinear kind of a result, and uh, let's see. Let's see how we're going to, to show this. Uh, that this is a sufficient condition follows immediately. Okay, this, this sufficient condition argument fo follows immediately from the previous theorem. Uh, since the bound on the number of mistakes is sublinear uh, in, uh, in that case. For the other direction, uh, how are we going to show that it's, in fact, it's a necessary condition? Um, right, we can think of the adversary, uh, basically that someone that flip a coin, uh, a fair coin, half and half, uh, on each round. Uh, if it lands head, then it, it rotates the target separator for the, um, say, the two-dimensional linear separator uh, origin-centered. Uh, it rotates this target separator, uh, uh, basically, say, clockwise, pi times, pi times uh, epsilon t read readings, and otherwise, uh, counterclockwise, uh, by the same amount, uh, by this amount as well. So if the next point falls into the region between these two possible uh, uh, next separators, the algorithm has at least a half a probability of guessing uh, the label correct, correctly, right? So, so it's because the region has a probability two times epsilon t, because you're only allowed to move uh, about to about about to uh, up to epsilon t amount, uh, the expected number of mistakes in in t rounds is at least the sum of the first t values uh, of the of the epsilon t, right? The sum of ep first epsilon t um, 
So, so, the, so the first epsilon t t equals 1 to capital T. So this sum has to grow sublinearly for any algorithm to be guaranteed uh, a sublinear expected, expected number of uh, mistakes. OK, so that's, that's the proof. OK, so, um, so what, what might wonder, uh, what happens in the special case where you actually have all these epsilon t values equal to some fixed constant epsilon? And uh, then this upper, the upper bound we just proved uh, become order square root epsilon times d, uh, square root epsilon d times capital T. It turns out this cannot generally uh, be improved. Okay, so we're going to show uh, kind of a lower bound argument. In particular, for the class of linear separators, we have the, this lower bound, which says there exists a distribution a data distribution such that for any learning algorithm, there is a sequence of target functions such that the epsilon t values are all equal epsilon, okay? And the number of mistakes is at least uh, square root epsilon d times t. Okay, so sometimes the bound is tight. Okay, for the sake of the, uh, of the simpler Presentation. I will just uh, go through the two-dimensional two case. Uh, so that's simple, right? So the high-dimensional case essentially repeats this kind of argument independently, uh, independently along all uh, axes. So let the um, to simplify, let the distribution uh, to be uniform on a, the unit circle, and we start with any target classifier. Okay. So we go in batches of. Uh, say one over <coughs> square root epsilon. Okay, uh, at the start of each of these batches, uh, the adversary flips <coughs> again, flips a fair coin, half and half. Uh, and if, if it lands ahead, uh, the next one over square root uh, epsilon uh, uh, runs, so it will rotate. So if the coin lands ahead, the, for the next uh, one over square root epsilon rounds. Uh, it rotates, uh, it just rotates the separator, uh, say, pi times epsilon readings clockwise. Okay. Okay. And otherwise, it does this counterclockwise. Okay. So the region where these two possible targets uh, disagree. These two possible target functions disagree increases by uh, two times epsilon probabili uh, probability on each round, right? Uh, so the region has size order uh, square root epsilon, right? Uh, after one over square root epsilon rounds, clear? So, so we, we will probably get a point in the region, a, point, a data point in the region within one over square root epsilon rounds. <laughs> in the region where these two possible separators disagree. Uh, for the first point, uh, we get in this region, the algorithm just uh, has so far seen no information about the outcome of the, of the coin flip. So it has a probability one half of uh, making a mistakes. Uh, so we expect uh, at least about one mistake uh, every one over square root epsilon samples. Which means, which, which means uh, in total uh, capital T samples, we get order square root uh, epsilon times T mistakes. Okay. We can also study an active learning variant of this, of this kind of a setting where the algorithm uh, has to explicitly uh, request the label of each example Upcoming example, the algorithm has to have active strategy, active learning strategy to decide whether it's going to, it's going to request a label of this point or not, right? So to observe the label of after each prediction, uh, then the prediction at each time can only be based on the labels of uh, the examples we've, uh, we, queried, we queried on previous rounds, right? So, uh, we are interested in having both a small number of mistakes and a small number of, number of queries. Okay. 
Right, so um, <coughs> the basic idea behind this strategy is to uh, basically, it's, a, it's kind of a, we want to, we want to turn this kind of a, uh, a target drifting problem into, we break them into segments uh, so that, or you say epochs, or, so that within each epoch, it is just um, a typical agnostic active learning problem that there's a famous algorithm uh, does this. So, so, so we break up the data streams into epochs. Okay, so if the epochs, is not too, the epochs are not too big, if they're small enough, we can just view this kind of, uh, uh, within the epoch, we can view all these uh, target functions within the epoch as one, uh, they can be referred to one single classifier plus some small noise. So, uh, right, so then these, uh, all the target concepts within each epoch will be quite similar, right? So, and we can essentially just run any off-the-shelf algorithm guaranteed to be tolerant to a small amount of arbitrary noise. So for instance, in the, in the case we use the standard uh, disagreement based on noise robust uh, active learning algorithm, uh, so specifically we run this active robust um, subroutine on uh, segment of capital M data points. So, so M, capital M is the size of the epoch. Okay. Uh, so we run this kind of algorithm at a time, and for each one, we just use a fairly standard, uh, this ro noise robust active learning um, strategy. So how it works. Uh, it works in batches of doubling size. So, so this kind of, a st kind of a standard active learning uh, noise ro robust active learning algorithm that works uh, in this way, it's basically, uh, it batches in doubling size. It doubles the sample every single round. So, and for each one, we see, we, we basically use the classifier from the previous batch uh, to make predictions, and then we only request the labels of the points in the region of a disagreement of uh, classifiers that survives uh, from the previous round. So again, the region of a disagreement is just a, uh, the kind of a data region where uh, for, for a point in that region, uh, there exists at least a pair of classifiers in the current version space that will disagree on this particular point, right? So, so, we, so at, at the end of each round, uh, we will pick the surviving classifier, uh, make the smallest number of mistakes as the classifier to use in the next round. Uh, and we will remove any classifiers making uh, significantly more uh, in what sense, in this kind of sense. What do you mean? So uh, what do you mean by significantly more? It is say, uh, compared to this kind of threshold, TK hat, uh, there's some classifiers that make significantly more mistakes than some other classifiers. So we can safely throw away those classifiers that are worse. Uh, and then uh, we're guaranteeing that we're not throwing away any good classifiers. It means the classifiers actually is close to the target. Okay. So this is the algorithm. Okay, so, um, so again, in active learning kind of problem, we're interested in save the number of queries to, uh, to describe the number of queries this algorithm uh, I, just, I just introduced that actually makes, we need to introduce another complexity measure. So say for any set of H, for any set of H, H is the set of classifiers, uh, we define the region of the disagreement. This is the formal definition here. I already explained the, what is region disagreement earlier, but here's a formal definition. Uh, the region of the disagreement called this, DIS of H, a set of classifier, uh, is a set of points for which there are two classifiers in H disagreeing on uh, their labels, okay? So also we define the ball of radius R uh, centered at a classifier H as the set of classifiers in the concept space C, okay, with a probability of disagreeing with uh, H at most R. So here you just define a ball around H with radius R by the amount, uh, the, the radius basically uh, is lower bounded by the probability that 
uh, G will, would disagree with H. So with the definition, so here, and then uh, that was the definition for the region disagreement for the ball. And then you can further define a topological notions called uh, disagreement coefficient, which is basically take the, um, uh, it's, a, it's a ratio between uh, the probability of the disagree on the ball of radius R around H divided by R, and you're, maximize, you're, max, uh, you're maximizing it over uh, H and R greater than some kind of argument R0. So basically, uh, uh, re, uh, disagreement coefficient tells us roughly the speed uh, to which the kind of a uh, version space would, would shrink. So you can see how much, it, well, if you wiggle our amount in uh, the version space uh, within the, with the ball within the uh, ball uh, with radius r centered around h, and then how much probability of a disagreement it will cause in the, in, the, in the data, right? So with this kind of a definition in hand, in hand, we can just describe the performance of this active learning algorithm in terms of, in terms of uh, the re, uh, discriminant coefficient of theta, right? Of course, you're gonna say, oh, well, theta seems like can be good or bad, depending on what kind of uh, H, what kind of a concept space you're studying, of course. <laughs> um, but when, so here's the, here the, uh, so, so, the theorem, so we, we, we say, uh, in a special case where all the epsilon t values are bounded by some constant, uh, say epsilon, uh, specifically if we set the capital M, which is the, the, ep uh, which is the, the epoch size, uh, to be uh, equal to theta uh, square root d over epsilon, uh, we pick uh, h hat k, h hat k, uh, okay? Uh, it's, the, it's basically the, s the size of samples in, each batch, and to be to make that um, pick that appropriately, then we we can uh, have this order of basically uh, big O two to ignoring the logarithm factor uh, square root d epsilon times t mistakes, and uh, then theta square root d times epsilon times the square root d epsilon times t queries. So here, I mean, if the theta is nice, if uh, the disagreement coefficient is nice, which means uh, this kind of a eliminating disagreement, disagreement based method can actually shrink your version space in, in a fairly fast way, uh, uh, then you would have a nice guarantee on the number of queries. Okay. Okay, so a little bit more technical uh, stuff, and then we'll switch on to, uh, uh, to the next part of this talk. So to prove this, we, we take a, a t hat, tk hat to be order uh, two to the two k times epsilon, and then we consider running an active algorithm with this argument t. So uh, note that a Schumacher bound implies the first target in this segment, say this kind of segment of data, uh, makes it most uh, that this many mistakes on each case batch, right? So, so this function will always this function will always serve, so that particular function will always survive. So you guarantee the good classifier will remain uh, in, the concept, in the version space. But then we, ben, it's also clear that the classifiers that make fewer mistakes also make the most uh, t hat k uh, mistakes. So they disagree on most, at most two times uh, t hat k points on the case round, so that's clear. Then a standard uh, VC bound will imply, so basically here the VC bound is used, used to connect the uh, empirical uh, performance, number of mistakes to the, uh, the distance. So the, the empirical distance from the data, from the labels you observe, the algorithm observe, to the kind of a distance in the probability. Right, so, um, right, so here the VC bound implies the probability these two classifiers that it's a gray, disagrees at most order, uh, say, uh, big O2 uh, tk hat over 2k times a plus d over 2 to the k, and then because the first uh, target in the, in, in the, in the segment is, uh, has a probability of making mistake at most square root d times epsilon on each point in a segment, then uh, it's, it's kind of easy that a triangle inequality would go glue them together and implies the uh, classifier.
um, making fewer fewer mistakes on round k has a probability and most order say uh, say t t uh, t k hat plus d over to the k larger than this, uh, and then summing all this over the samples, these samples this adds up to uh, adds up to order square root d uh, times epsilon times capital T, right? So uh, no, here is uh, times m, which is the batch size uh, total number of mistakes uh, per segment of this. M samples in total. Uh, so bounding the number of queries and the other part of the theorem is kind of uh, easy because uh, we have the notion of uh, uh, discriminant coefficient, right? So uh, the set of surviving surviving classifiers, the classifiers that would survive after, uh, so on round K, will have the distance of the first target in the segment uh, at most uh, two, uh, so the uh, big O two theta. So basically, uh, basically it's t, t k hat, t k, t k minus one hat. So the probability of the disagreement is the most um, big O two to theta discriminant coefficient uh, times the square root of d epsilon. Okay, that's a simple combinatorics argument. Now, so um, so far we have been discussing this kind of a very uh, it's kind of a general as a kind of uh, scenario where you achieve good guarantees, very good guarantees on the number of mistakes, number of queries for this kind of a general varying epsilon t scenario, but they typically will not be computationally efficient, right? Because they typically use empirical risk minimizer, so we cannot use them in practice. If you run a kind of algorithm on the real data side, you would, something, you would want something efficient. So as I mentioned earlier, this recent work by uh, by Kramer, Mansour, Yvandar, and Van, uh, uh, they study a polynomial type algorithm uh, in the special case where the epsilon t values are all bounded by or all bounded by some kind of uh, uh, epsilon, uh, some kind of epsilon is constant. Okay, and and, and here c is the space of uh, so we take the special case. So, so here they study the special case of the concept space. It's just um, uh, linear separator, okay? Homogeneous linear separators, uh, specifically they achieve, uh, when they achieve the number of mistakes, it's uh, roughly uh, uh, epsilon times t to the one fourth times t, which is somewhat worse than Humboldt and Long did, which is um, uh, square root epsilon times t times t mistakes, which if you remember. Uh, so, right, so uh, the question is whether whether we can achieve a better guarantee on the number of mistakes, as Hamilton and Long did, well, same time makes the algorithm um, efficient. Okay, so indeed we show that such such an algorithm does exist. So, so here I should mention the work of uh, the Kramer et al. Uh, actually studied uh, a more general family of distributions uh, to satisfy a certain relation between the angles and the probabilities of disagreements. Uh, in some sense, the uniform distribution is the canonical example of this kind of a family uh, of distributions called lambda good. Uh, right, so, but we don't know like whether we can extend our result to the, the, the kind of more general family of lambda good distributions, so that is open problem. Okay, so, uh, so the algorithm uh, we study uh, it's a slight, it's a, just a, sli it's a, it's a slight, slight twist on the uh, method recently proposed by uh, Awasti, Balkan, and Lang. Uh, just very recent paper, uh, which is a kind of margin-based learning um, algorithm based on, it's, it's, it's designed to efficiently uh, learn even in the agnostic model with a certain noise rate. Uh, right, but uh, so they, ha they have a parameter alpha to basically uh, is to tell you the noise rate on the order of the desired kind of uh, error rate. Uh, so we we essentially are not uh, two two different, uh, right? So so bas basically, so here's so here's here's the algorithm that's uh, shown here. We break the uh, the data sequence again up to those. Um, blocks of size M, again, the similar kind of strategy. And so within each block, uh, they target concepts 
are very similar again. So we efficiently think of this kind of differences um, at the most uh, kind of, uh, this kind of differences uh, between the classifiers within the epoch is, can be viewed as some kind of uh, noise with the noise rate alpha, say. Uh, th thus, it, it allows us to uh, basically uh, treat this problem similar to the problem uh, of ID learning uh, with noise. Okay. So uh, then within each epoch, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna use the, this margin-based uh, learning algorithm I just uh, described by uh, Awasti, uh, Balkan, and Long. Uh, right, so which maintains our, a current, the, the, the algorithm maintains our current hypothesis on each round K, okay? And then looks at the next few samples uh, in the sequence and requests the labels of the points within some kind of distance B. It's a slab, the B can be thought as, it's a slab within B distance from the, um, uh, from the linear separator. Uh, right, you, we only request labels if the data point falls within the slab of, of, uh, of size V, uh, right, um, from the current uh, hypothesis, the current linear separator. So that's the active learning uh, component of this algorithm. Okay, um, so, uh, so, so it then uses those labeled examples uh, to do a kind of empirical risk uh, minimization, which is basically in this step. It's, it's really quite complicated, but actually it's, it's just because uh, we have, we're using, uh, just because the uh, empirical risk minimizer may not exist sometimes, so you need this kind of a constraints to, uh, to guarantee that. And here, L tall K is a weighted hinge loss. So, so hinge loss, right, is like a, it's a linear it's a linear function with a certain slope tau k and equals to z, uh, zero becomes the function value becomes zero at uh, point uh, point zero. So 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 here the step six is just doing empirical risk minimization, um, uh, subject uh, using this kind of a rescaled hinge loss, uh, subject to the constraint on how far uh, the new separator can be from the previous one. Okay, so, so that's a slab thing, right? We actually, in fact, the size of the slab shrinks exponentially. So the prediction are made using the current separator uh, uh, on each round, right? So at, uh, you're gonna predict using the current separator and then you're gonna to do the empirical risk. You're gonna to decide whether you're gonna request the label and then you're gonna to try to do an empirical risk minimization Okay, so, good. So uh, to prove that this kind of algorithm uh, makes order square root v epsilon times t mistakes, the algorithm is efficient. And we're trying to show that it makes as good kind of number of mistakes as the, uh, as the uh, Humboldt and Long's result. Uh, but however, the algorithm is not efficient. Uh, we first mentioned that the original work of uh, uh, Awasi, Awasi at all proves that uh, for a given noise rate alpha, for a given noise rate, noise rate alpha in the agnostic learning scenario, these techniques, uh, these techniques can produce a classifier with uh, error rate on the order of alpha, uh, right, in polynomial time. Uh, using a number of uh, queries uh, on the order of d squared. But in fact, uh, after checking their proofs, I found uh, probably some steps like 20-ish steps in their proofs can be, uh, if they count more carefully, uh, you could actually improve the d squared to, to d. Right, so a, another observation is that if we take blocks of size square root d over epsilon, if we, if we take the block size to be that big, um, then there's always a classifier in this concept space, okay, with error rate less than square root d times epsilon on every point within each block. Okay, so we take alpha noise rate to be equal to square root d times epsilon, and we can achieve error rate order, uh, right, so order square root d times epsilon within each block, right, that's, 
that's clear. So by picking the sample size for each round of uh, the algorithm to, to be geometric, so that's the geometric sequence of the sample size uh, for each round, we can show that the number of mistakes within each block uh, will then be order square root d times epsilon times m. m is the, m is the uh, epoch size, which is order d. Okay, so be, then it, in T samples, we, can, uh, we will make order D times uh, t, capital T over M, which is roughly uh, order uh, square root D times epsilon times T mistakes. That's the mistakes guarantee. Uh, similarly, because we make order D queries uh, per block, so uh, in T samples, we make uh, order uh, D times M over, over uh, D times T over M, uh, which is uh, order square root d times epsilon times t uh, queries. Okay, so that's the calculation. So in summary, okay, we presented a technique that adapts to a changing target concept, and we proved the guarantee uh, its number of mistakes. We also showed that uh, kind of uh, this kind of guarantee generally cannot be. Uh, improved by uh, showing a scenario where uh, it is, in fact, minimax optimal. So we also generalize this, that, re this, uh, that particular result to an active learning uh, setting and prove the bound on the number of queries okay, in terms of the dis disagreement coefficient. Right? So, so while maintaining the same guarantee on the number of mistakes. Good. Um, in the special case of linear separators, homogeneous linear separators under uniform distribution, uh, where the amount by which uh, the target concept is allowed to drift is at most a fixed constant to epsilon. Uh, we presented an algorithm and proved the guarantee on the number of mistakes, uh, which is better than the best algorithm uh, in the prior literature. Uh, and it is efficient. The algorithm is also an active learning algorithm. If you remember, we're picking the queries based on active learning strategy, which is uh, we're picking the queries only if it lands in a, uh, the slab, which is within some kind of distance from the current hypothesis. And that slab, the size of the slab shrinks exponentially. So uh, we, will, we prove the guarantee on the number of queries it makes, uh, which is roughly as, uh, you know, uh, the same as the bound on its number of mistakes. All right, thanks. Well, for the special case, if you consider uh, the, the, the concept space is a bunch of classifiers have kind of a smooth guarantee, which is like, for example, piecewise smooth or piecewise linear, then, uh, then you can have further constraint on how, how infrequently they, uh, they would drift. But, but at the same time, I, I mean, it's actually, uh, there are always two views about this kind of problem. One is just argue combinatorically, view the classifier just like one point in the space of functions. Another view is m more like, consider that it's like a trajectory. And then you're trying to bound the complexity of the bunch of trajectories it allows to be. Well, that's a more specific kind of a model that you can study. Um, well, well, that's But it keeps shifting by zero, 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 and suddenly there's a peak, and then zero, zero. But this kind of shift is still discrete. 
but uh, it may not be bounded about by a constant epsilon. But obviously, um, if we can exploit the structure of this, it will correspond to certain um, like recommendation systems in practice when the shift of um, pupils' pace on movies do not change gradually, but uh, sometimes there's a sudden change after I see one of the yeah, so this kind of abrupt change is basically you have, it basically it stays smoothly, it stays uh, not changing uh, a lot of times. But however, there's, you can put some kind of constraint on the differential, like uh, what kind of rate you can, what do you mean by sudden? It's like you're putting constraints on the differential. Uh, right, so yeah, you can study that special case. I believe you can further improve, uh, not improve the bound, but for that kind of scenario, um, you have a bound. But I think that's, that also is a special case of the drifting uh, at most uh, epsilon amount or varying epsilon t. I think that's, that's the special case of that. 